This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. Welcome into another edition of Three Ma. I am John Kurtz. It is just DY and I today. Cole is uh, on vacay with the fam. He's probably on um, what's the what's the ride everybody loves? At uh, I think that's Disneyland. He's at Disney World. I don't know Magic Kingdom. What's the most famous ride that's there? DY. Magic Space Mountain, that's what I was trying to think of. Space Mountain, but I don't think Space Mountain is there. So, you know, I don't know. Whatever the Florida version of Space Mountain is. I think is. it is. Yeah, I think it is. Is it there too? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, Cole's probably on Space Mountain right now instead of uh, doing doing a podcast with us. But, you know, we'll power through. We'll get it done for the people because uh, we love you here on Three Moths. And, you know, if I were with three children on Space Mountain or the teacups or whatever, I'd probably want to drink from my friends at Holiday Distillery. Yeah, they've got some 360 vodka. That would, I'm sure, hit the spot. Maybe some Ben Holiday bottled and bond bourbon. Uh, but either of those offerings are great for you under any circumstance. You don't need to go to uh, Orlando to do that. Uh, you can go to the liquor store and pick it up and have it for the next K-State Hoops game uh, for your pregame on Saturday before K-State TCU, a little postgame celebration rewatching the Super Bowl, whatever it might be, uh, get over to our friends at Holiday Distillery. I actually, I was at a, an event on, uh, it was last Saturday, and there was a giveaway, and they were giving away a Holiday Distillery basket. I was like, man, it's it's everywhere. It's everywhere. So they're great K-State yeah. folks who uh, support us. Pre-gaming the uh, basketball game this upcoming Saturday, starting bright and early, that's an 11 a.m. game. Hey, K State fans are used to doing that, DY. I mean, how many how many eleven AM kickoffs have been played over the last, you know, ten years or whatever? There's there's nothing unusual about that, I feel like, for K State fans. That's a challenge, by the way, DY just issued to all of you listening to this. That's a challenge. Wake up and take a shot of uh, some Ben Holiday bottled in Bond bourbon. Hey, K State hoops, man. Uh there's no midweek game here. They've had a bit of a chance. Uh, to rest. Uh, maybe we can start with that. I mean, it's a new concept this year because of the way that the schedule breaks down that you get the the midweek break here. I, how how advantageous can this be for this team? I Did this feel like a particularly tired, beleaguered team to you after the BYU game? Like, how, how do you try and utilize this sort of an advantage this week? I don't know that it was more tired than usual, right? I, I think there's moments in games where I'm like, you could tell that this team's a little bit gassed. And and I think that's true of, you know, several teams in the Big 12 because I don't know about you, but it seems like there's a lot more shorter benches this year than normal. I mean, KU barely has a bench yeah. at all, for example, and that's caught up to them. And, and Kansas State has, what, three guys and Perry, Kaluma, and Carter that are playing really heavy minutes. I mean... Tyler Perry's what went over 40 minutes probably four or five times this year so I you know anytime's good time for probably a little bit more rest a little bit more break but they also had it last week too right after the KU game now they didn't get a break completely but they got some extra days off because they did play a Monday game and they'll have that again next week because it's another Monday game when they play Texas and Austin yeah uh, that that's a good point they actually are kind of hitting a a stretch here that's that's nice to get some extra rest um, and just hopefully freshen up for the stretch run. I'm with you. I don't think this is a team that struck me as, you know, I mean, they, they made their big charge against BYU late, right? I mean, they clearly weren't gassed late in the game. They, they got back into it after being down by 17, but, you know, you take advantage of it as much as you can. They're, they're not one for excuses at all. I, I will say if you caught the interview with uh, Yurik Malagy, K-State associate head coach, you know, when I was asking him about the altitude and going to play in, in Provo, he was just like kind of like, no, you know, whatever. No excuses. I get, like, you know, we're, I, get, I get the same reaction from Coach Tang when I asked him in a press conference. He looked at me like I had four eyeballs. I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah. No, they, they did not, they did not want to entertain that question at all. I just thought, like, hey, here's, you know, here's a nice softball if you want to talk about some sort of a challenge like that. No, no interest in it at all. Uh, he took the pitch, he did not swing at the softball he just let that one go by and spit on it so you know hey fair enough but i think the significance obviously of tcu i mean it's a home game that's left on the schedule and you're fighting for your ncaa tournament life uh you you probably need to win that game uh tcu west virginia iowa state and byu all left on the home schedule according to ken palm this is the second easiest game left on the schedule giving them a 46 percent chance to win 
behind the 81% chance with West Virginia. And, you know, we can understand why that one's higher up on the pecking order. But uh, yeah, TCU is very gettable here. And I don't know, you know, we've talked so much about getting to nine, nine wins. May take more than that, D.Y., because right now you start looking at the resume. K-State is 77 in the net. Um, I saw Ryan Gilbert from Go Power Cat tweet out that the lowest team to ever make it into the NCAA tournament um, was ranked 77th in the net um, in this in the net era. So you're teetering on that line anyway. You're not even in the next four out on ESPN's bracketology. You look at most bracketologies right now you're kind of off the bubble. You know, you, you almost need to play your way back onto the legitimate bubble, at least being like really, really close uh, to getting into the NCAA tournament. So they need to pick it up. They need to pick it up. And I, I, you would struggle to see, you'd really have to squint to see how you're making the NCAA tournament if you do not win this game on Saturday. Yeah. Now, 9-9 nine and nine is the bare minimum. That would be winning your four home games, right, against Iowa State, TCU, BYU, and West Virginia. And, yeah, they're not on it now, but you got to think about that. If you go and take care of those four games, that is two more quad one wins to bring you to four. Maybe you get fortunate with Providence rising up a little bit. I don't know, and you get lucky and there's five. And then, you know, not to be diminished too much, is that would be two quad two wins with TCU and West Virginia as well if you were to take care of business at home. And let's say the Frogs get hot, and maybe that turns into a quad one win. So there is avenues where – Nine and nine could work and look if you and at the bare minimum, if you do grab those four games, that's two quad one wins, that's two quad two wins. You probably do put yourself right back into the discussion of maybe being, you know, last four in, first four out, next four out, if you were to win those four games. Cause not all of those teams that are in that uh neighborhood right now are even going to get as many chances at quad one and quad two type wins as Kansas State will. So you have to take that into consideration. Um, so I, I think there's a chance here's the only thing. And cause if you do win this four games, your net probably comes up into the fifties or sixties as well. That, that's something to consider because even if you do lose the road games, they're not going to hurt you too much in the net as long as you are competitive. But here's the, like I said, here's the thing you, we've seen it in the past that if you don't do enough away from your home building, you can be dinged for that too. And I think Kansas State's what their best win away from home is a neutral side win over Providence. And after that, it's winning at LSU, probably. That's the only thing that's really coming to mind. I don't think they're getting a lot of credit for beating Wichita State in a neutral side affair either. So uh, well, I, I think I would suggest that next on the list is probably being within two points in Ames with like two minutes to go. Yeah. I mean, you still get credit for a win. Yeah, but yeah I agree. I, yeah. I know. I'm just saying, like, in, the, yeah. the crazy part is we were feeling pretty good for a while. Like early on in the conference schedule, they went and beat West Virginia. They had an eight-point lead at Texas Tech with like three minutes left. And then they go to Ames, and it's a two-point game with like two minutes left with, you know, a whole army of spies looking in on the huddle. So, uh, yeah. you know, it, it felt pretty good about at the time about what they were able to do on the road. And now, obviously, that's kind of fallen. But even then, I mean, you look at it like BYU, they came charging back. It's a one-possession game in the the last minute of it in what's been a tough place to play in Provo. Like, yeah, but they got to get over the hump. Point taken. They, yeah. they have to get over the hump. I think one of your quad one wins needs to be on the road to kind of take that potential committee angle of penalizing you for it. That's what I would say. Take that away. So, because one... I said it at the time, and it's really starting to rear its head, right? Where you're really going to look back and think what could have been in Lubbock because that should have been a win. That's a quad one win on the road. And if that, even if that result is reversed, take away the Oklahoma game, which was bad, the Oklahoma State game, which was bad, Nebraska, which was bad. If they reverse the result of the Texas Tech game, they probably are on the bubble right now, and they probably are maybe, you know, with good basketball at home trending towards an NCAA tournament berth, that Texas Tech loss in Lubbock, that one's really twisting the knife on them right now. It is. Yeah, I think they would absolutely be at least, they'd be on the graphic, right? If we're talking about the bracketology graphic where they do first four out, next four out, last four in, next four in, they'd be somewhere there on the graphic. I don't know if it would 100% put them in, but yeah, I'd have you sitting here like, okay, take care of business at home, you'll be okay. Uh, yeah. Instead, now like it may it may take a little bit more than that. And if you're talking about getting a road win, 
I mean, look, I know Kansas just lost. Uh, they just got basically 30 balled uh, by Texas Tech earlier this week, but I'm I'm certainly going to abstain that game, I think, from the conversation here. No disrespect to, to this K-State team at all, but that's that's just kind of the deal. I mean, we saw what happened to Houston uh, of all teams in Lawrence. So you've got at Texas and you've got at Cincy. I mean, how how realistic is winning at Texas and or Cincy? Uh, well, I think those two teams are teams that have probably been the most vulnerable at all. So um, maybe aside from Oklahoma State as well, but those three come to mind in terms of the teams that have been vulnerable at home. You don't even put Kansas State in that mix. They've only lost once at home. It's because they came out flat against Oklahoma. They defeated KU at home, Baylor at home. But Cincinnati and Texas, I mean, they've lost to what Iowa State, I think Houston. Um, those are two. If you're going to pick two teams that you you must have a road win against, man, it, it, besides Oklahoma State, it'd be hard pressed not to pick Texas or Cincinnati. And Oklahoma State doesn't even give you a quad one, so you probably wouldn't pick that. Or West Virginia, because it wouldn't give you a quad one win opportunity. So of the ones that give you a quad one win opportunity, you certainly pick Cincinnati and you would certainly pick Texas, especially the Longhorns. Cause I think they've lost four times at home. They have won two in a row at home as well in Austin and that Kings Monday. So quick turnaround following the home game against TCU, where you do have one of those giant road opportunities with when you play the Longhorns at the, what the Moody center, I think it's what it's called. Um, so can't say one last year uh, in Austin and they'll have to do it again this year or the the pressure ratchets up for, you know, the road contest in Cincinnati. So there, you have to squint pretty hard, but there is a path here. Um, but personally, I do think you have to take care of one of these road games in addition to going unble- unblemished at home. And you really look at the schedule and because three of the next four are at home, and one of and the road game is at Texas. This could be the defining stretch of the season in terms of are they going to make the NCAA tournament or not? Because it is conceivable now. Aside from starting four one in the Big Twelve, we haven't felt like this team is capable of doing this against Big Twelve competition. But you're home against TCU, at Texas, home against BYU, home against West Virginia, and even after that, you're at Cincinnati. Those are probably your easiest games left on the schedule, and you get five of them right in a row before you go to KU and host Iowa State. So you're just yeah, that last week, that last week yeah. of conference get is not easy. Not no, easy. it's pretty brutal because uh, as much as it you know probably pains us to say, Kansas is probably not in the Big Twelve championship discussion at least not at this point unless something bizarre happens, and and obviously that can happen. You know, KU always it tends to find a way, but they seem like they're definitely on the outside looking in especially with how putrid they have been on the road it really seems like it's not an Iowa State Baylor and Houston and even now like it'd be hard pressed not to say Iowa State's playing the best out of those three teams which is not something I anticipated saying before the season that is a tough tough team they're a reason why they're tied for first right now with Houston because those two teams are undefeated at home so they're taking care of business where they need to take care of business and they have more road wins in the league than anybody else well, they also cheat. So, <laughs> I mean, there's a. Well, Houston, hey, hey, let's not disrespect Houston. Well, I'm not disrespecting, no, Iowa State cheats, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Not, not Houston. Um, yeah, anyway, no, I mean, fair point. Uh, Kansas, I, I saw a, a tweet the other day. I wish I could remember the exact specifics of it, but it was Kansas's home record or uh, road record. Maybe not every year the Bills sell fair, but at least like the last 10. And you can see that that 2020 season. They, I believe, were nine and zero on the road. Like that team was really good. That didn't get a chance to play in the tournament because of COVID. Um, but for the last, it started in like eighteen or nineteen. They've been very ordinary on the road. Like they, they know Kansas is no longer this like automatic. It, it must have been like eighteen, nineteen when that started because that was the year like K State and Tech both tied for the the league title and Kansas didn't win it. Since then, they've been pretty ordinary, you know, hovering like around 500 on the road, which is what that's that's allowed other teams to get more into the Big 12 race. And the, Kansas is not an invincible thing on the road. We've seen it with K-State. You know, I mean, it's it's close to 500 over the last, wherever you want to timestamp it. I, the Frank Martin era since then, I think it's like 7 and 10 in Bramlage. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's much closer than you might think. So they're gettable. But what we don't typically see is them losing by 29 on the road. And, and I know Kevin McCuller was was not playing in that game, but I was going to ask that, frame it up this way, like, does that make you feel 
in a way less confident. Like I know that you almost won in Lubbock, but the the juice recently has been, hey, they they found a way to beat Kansas, and it was another one kind of like the Baylor game where you had to. I mean, is it some voodoo magic almost to figure out a way to win it in overtime? Does that does that make you a little bit less optimistic looking at what Kansas is now, in particular on the road, if if they have that kind of an effort in them to go lose by twenty nine uh, at Texas Tech, who's solid but not outstanding? Yeah, I understand thinking that the Kansas win looks a little less impressive now. But let's not forget, like, the Jayhawks had Kevin McCuller in Manhattan. They did not have Kevin McCuller in Lubbock. And I know I'm not trying to take anything away from Texas Tech, but KU still gets up for the K-State game more than they would the Texas Tech game as well. Um, And Hunter Dickinson, I I will point this out. That dude's, like, I know he's still technically kind of getting his numbers because that's what he does. But, boy, he's in a... Uh, from an efficiency standpoint, he's slumping hard right now. He did not look very good the other night, man. He he did not look very good at all. I and can't. Well, I mean, look, we could talk about we got we need to break too, but we could talk about Kansas for a while and some of their issues. But you know, I mean, serves Bill Self right for taking a chance on Arterio Morris. That's really hurt their their uh, depth, and that was a guy that you probably should not have taken a chance on by what had been in his history. So they've they've got that as a problem. Like you spend a ton of money on a ton of NIL resources on Hunter Dickinson because he's the best guy in the portal. But like, wasn't the reputation at Michigan kind of like hey, they they have a lot of talent, but like sort of empty stats, and they weren't that good of a team. And Hunter Dickinson with his attitude, I mean, all that it just checks out to me. You know, I mean, it kind of checks out that he would be a guy that puts up a lot of numbers, but is not necessarily like a Bill Self winner sort of a guy and you know it's a, it's a whole other discussion with Kansas transfer portal era they're not going to be able to hold on to some of those program guys as long because they're going to go transfer somewhere else to to play and so your depth that's coming in off the bench is not going to be as good you know a lot of stuff going on there but yeah conference race right now seems to be what would you put it at Baylor Iowa State Houston yep leave it leave it there Baylor Iowa State Houston for the conference title race could make that home game against Iowa State at the uh at the end of the regular season on March 9th. Very, very, very interesting. Okay, get over to uh, homefieldapparel.com. Not only are they great supporters of us here, but they're now great supporters of uh, Cats NIL. K-State's NIL uh, Collective has now partnered up with them as well. So all the more reason to head over to homefieldapparel.com right now. Get your K-State gear there. Stock up on the 40-plus designs that they have, and you can even get... 15% 15% off your first order using promo code 3MA23. Promo code 3MA23 for 15% off your first order at homefieldapparel.com, or you can even branch out from K-State stuff and check out the 100-plus other schools that they have. It is a great place to go to get all the college gear that you want. We are back in just a moment. We appreciate you supporting KC Sports Network by listening to our podcast. You have helped us become the highest-ranked Chiefs podcast network in 2022 and 2023. And don't forget about our daily Substack newsletter, the best written analysis you can find on the Chiefs straight to your inbox every day. kcsn.substack.com All right, so now you got a game coming up actually against TCU. Um, If you were to power rank DY, the easiest to hardest games left on the schedule. I think we'd both put West Virginia as the easiest left, right? Would you have TCU at home as number two, or would it perhaps be BYU at home? Which would you have as the more gettable game? And then I kind of want to go through and rank these with you. Cool. Yeah, it's one of those, I mean, maybe you probably don't want to pick a road game, but maybe at Cincinnati kind of gets into the mix. I don't know. I I think BYU is better than TCU. I really do. But I'm not so sure that I wouldn't rather play BYU if I was Kansas State. I did. Just the way that TCU runs, because they are a team that are just predicated on the fast break almost exclusively, I just don't know how K-State will fare against that. It remains to be seen. We don't really have a, because they're only playing the Frogs once this year, we don't really have a gauge of what that looks like. So is that a better matchup? Is that a worse matchup for K-State? 
you really haven't played a team like that yet this year. Yeah, I mean, my my argument for maybe the BYU game is a little bit easier was going to be that they're really, I mean, they take a lot of threes. They're pretty reliant on threes, and they haven't been a great shooting team, which has led to some of their struggles, and you would typically think of them being worse on the road and K-State defending pretty well at home. So if you can get a game that's a total clunker from three-point range for BYU, then maybe that makes it a little bit easier. Now, at the same time, they went, what, were they 2 of 13 in the first half in the game in Provo, and and they still had a nine-point lead at, at halftime and obviously beat K-State. So maybe that's not entirely true. I'd, I'd almost just push, you know, like 2A, 2B on the, the TCU and BYU games there probably. Yeah, uh, that BYU game is weird, right? Because they went 2 of 13 from 3 in the first half, led by 9, then shot it a lot better from 3 in the second half, and that's when Kansas State made their charge. So it, it was kind of a bizarre way that that, it, that that unfolded. Sight unseen, really, for me on Cincinnati. I have barely watched them at all this year. Texas has been legitimate. I mean, they, they've lost so many home games. But I don't know. It's hard for me to to put Texas as an easier game than Cincinnati. I guess I would go Cincy then, what, that'd be four, and Texas at five, and then Iowa State at home at Kansas. I think that's probably the order here. We're going to finish this thing out. Well, yeah, I, I, I like that. So, yeah, so West Virginia at home, then maybe a push between TCU and BYU. I agree. Um, and then you have to go to those two road games. Do you think you still think Iowa State at home is tougher than those two road games at Texas and Cincinnati? I uh, I guess that's a good question. I hadn't entertained that thought. I was like, oh, just formality because of the way Iowa State's playing right now. I mean, that's that should, assuming that K-State at least has a first chance at the NCAA tournament by that point, that should be a really fired up crowd based on not only the rivalry in general, but everything that happened earlier this year. So... I guess how how much better or maybe not is Iowa State than Kansas or Baylor, who they already beat at home? That's probably an important piece of this to to dissect if we're going to do this. Yeah, they played each other once, and I, and Baylor did win that game. But just I do think Iowa State's the more complete team right now, just because they're actually playing defense. Baylor's defense kind of comes and goes, maybe a little bit more firepower in offense. Iowa State's really efficient on the offensive end, though. Man, they're like top 10 efficiency offense same defense at this point. So, I'd, look, Baylor's probably got more potential to kind of run you off the floor, so to speak. But I think Iowa State's the better team. That's that's what I would have said, man. And if you look at the head-to-head results, I mean, they, they handled Kansas pretty well in Hilton. And then the Baylor game was that crazy game where, you know, if they had another – tenth of a second now they got a break with the way that they got to inbound the ball but if they had another tenth of a second on the clock they would have still won that game that was a pretty wild one the Scott Drew getting ejected the 20 to nothing run um all that stuff that happened there I think you'd have to probably give the nod to Iowa State as being a better team yeah I'm I'm still going to put Iowa State as a more difficult game than at Texas and at at Cincy I think it's after some delivery fair. here that's probably fair um and if you're Kansas State, it almost and look, you, you want to win every game you can, right? But heck, it, you would trade. Technically, you would trade an Iowa State home win for two road wins there because both those are quad ones. You're getting two quad one wins instead of the one. Two for the Which price is, of one. You know, what what is Cincinnati? Where is Cincinnati? Like in the in the net? They're in the, the top and forty, top thirty. So frustrating, man. It's, it's funny. So uh, the net is so bizarre. Like. To kind of touch on it a little bit here, Ohio State is very bad this year, and they just had to fire their coach. I think they were still better in the net than Kansas State. I mean, Cincinnati's four and seven in the league, and their non-con. I'm looking here; they beat Evansville, Stetson, Merrimack, Bryant, Florida Gulf Coast, Howard, Georgia Tech, Northern Kentucky, Eastern Washington, Detroit Mercy, and Illinois Chicago. Anything jump out at you there? I mean, the best the best non-con win that they have is Georgia Tech and Eastern Washington, who are 122 and 139. They lost to Xavier. They lost to Dayton. I mean, but they, you know what they have? They have some blowout wins. They didn't go to overtime with some of the non-con bye games. Like, I, that's, that's the difference, I guess, right now. 
Yeah. And it's also like how you take care of those teams and how you lose, right? We're, we're seeing it kind of unfold in the way that you can manipulate it, but the, the margin of victory here because of efficiency being um, emphasized hurts. Like Kansas State barely beating Chicago State hurts. Kansas State barely beating North Alabama hurts. Kansas State barely beating Oral Roberts hurts. Like those, those are the types of things hurt. And they're not, they didn't really run that many teams off the floor and they got blasted a little bit too, right? You get kind of get blasted by Nebraska. You get blasted by Oklahoma. You get blasted by Houston. I think you lost by double digits to both Miami and USC as well. Very true. Yeah. And if you look at, I mean, Cincinnati's in the first four out right now, according to uh, Joe Lenardi. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, just go in that game then. I guess just go in that game. Uh, what do you think of TCU? What's what's the matchup like with uh, with the Horn Frogs? Yeah, that's the interesting part, and I haven't got all the metrics yet from Fan that he kind of that he typically helps guide me a little bit in this discussion. Um, or Cole has rattles it off. I will say, I mean, they have kind of a balanced scoring a little bit, just like BYU in terms of. You know, it looks like they, you know, probably have seven, eight players that can score in double digits on any given night. Um, yeah, a lot of guys that have played a lot of basketball. Yeah, some of these guys you will be familiar with because they've been at TC for a while, like Chuck O'Bannon, Xavier Cork, Micah PV, Emmanuel Miller, who is their leading scorer by a significant margin. Even Avery Anderson, who's been at TCU a couple years now, and before that was at Oklahoma State. So that's a lot of guys they brought in Ernest Uday. Um, and then two other guys they they rely a lot on are Trivia Tennyson and, and Jameer Nelson Jr., who's probably their best transfer pickup as well. And I think uh, Case underscore fan was telling us uh, either yesterday or a couple of days ago that I think every single player of TCU's top eight or top nine in their rotation was at one time a transfer. Oh, yeah. I, yeah did see that the other day. I mean, sign of the times for sure. I mean, I'm looking through their, their Ken Palm profile, the thing that definitely sticks out. I mean, they're pretty, they're, they're better offensively than defensively, but still 51st in the country in defensive efficiency. And they are 16th in the country in steal percentage. And that's, that's gotta be a, gotta be a concern with how much K-State turns the ball over. Now, K-State has won a lot of games with 15 plus turnovers this year, but uh, they are definitely one to to cough up the ball, give up transition opportunities. TCU's uh, possession length is um, is also pretty short. Um, they're 25th in the country in in possession length, so like they're getting up and down in transition. That's that's how they're going to want to do things against uh, K State. So you got to be careful. Yeah, I mean that's kind of what they've been. Jamie Dixon switched to to that kind of system, philosophy, and strategy what two or three years ago. Where, you know, that's where really when his I felt like his program maybe kind of started to go up because they, I think they were kind of that mediocre, always on the bubble team for a while under Dixon. He goes to that system where it's like, let's just play fast and just beat teams down the court. And all of a sudden, they're more of a top four, top five team in a Big 12 year in and year out. So um, whatever made him go to that change, it's a little bit of a unique style that sometimes can probably get them caught when they play a team that is a tough matchup with them because they're so much the other way. Um, so they're they're a really matchup dependent when it comes to the NCAA tournament. But that change in philosophy has at least allowed them to have more success and and compete at the higher level within the conference. So who's going to be most important uh, for K State in this game? Like who? I mean, obviously, I think you probably need a a better performance from Tyler Perry than you got yeah. on uh, on Saturday. But uh, who, who are you going to have your eye on there? Uh, the other bigs, right? David Gasson and, Jer- and Jarrell Colbert. And then now the stamina thing for Colbert could be more significant at the way TCU runs a lot. But can you play Will McNair with the way they run? That's, I mean, Kansas State's kind of up against it. It'll be interesting how they try to rotate those bigs because I think that's probably one of the items that I'll be looking at the most. Can Jarrell Colbert play solid minutes? Uh, how well, many minutes? Say, I mean, right. Colbert's. Colbert's the guy, yeah, that seems like he has a pretty limited burst that he can give you, and he's been pretty effective in a lot of games, BYU notwithstanding. Yeah. But how how long is he able to hang if TCU is going to be yeah. up and down? Yeah, For Colbert, how long can he hang? And for McNair, it's can he, can he get there in time? Because he's not as fast as the other right. guys. 
Do you worry about that? Do you see more David Gasson at the five because of it? That'll be interesting to see. So that's just something that I'll be kind of looking at. And does Jerome Tay maybe go with a deeper rotation because of the way TCU runs? What's your gut telling you right now before we get out of here? How uh, how you feeling about this one? I I feel like it's a win because they're at home. Now, the Oklahoma and Nebraska games notwithstanding, uh, Jerome Tang only lost one game at home last year, and that was to Texas, probably a game that they should have won. Um, even despite all the struggles this year, only lost one conference game at home, which is saying something because they've already went through KU and Baylor, right, two of the tougher foes that you'll play at home. So I just like it for the fact that it'll be a home game, and, and you would anticipate it being somewhat of a significant crowd. Now, I don't know if the, I, it sounds like the students didn't claim their full allotment for the first league game of, um, for the first time this season. Um, I don't think that's total apathy setting in. I think some of that also might be, I don't know, I can't really remember the last time there was an 11 a.m. tip in Bramlage Coliseum. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I, I, I am with you. Like, I, I would lean toward a K State win because it is at home, but they are, this team has that card that you know is is still there that they could put down that just, you know, totally goes belly up and they play an Oklahoma or Nebraska game and that's happened. I was going through the schedule. It was like you went through seven home games before you got to Nebraska, then you went through another five before you got to Oklahoma. It's kind of like every five or six home games you get a stinker and they've got, if you include Kansas, which came after Oklahoma, Kansas plus four more home games, like in this last five game stretch like is there another dud for them to to lay here i think is kind of the question you know will will that happen i i doubt that it would happen against tcu i have my my doubts that it would occur here but uh yeah that that to me will be one of the big questions about whether or not they get to the ncaa tournament is can they avoid having another one of those horrible performances at home that we've we've seen a couple of times this year because other than that they have been very good they have been very good at home and clutch yeah. at home with it to be uh, but yeah, definitely clutch too. I, if there's another one like that, I just think it happens on the road. Uh, maybe at KU because it always happens at KU. So uh, that's that's what you would think, or kind of what you need to happen. Almost, I don't know. It's this team is pretty unpredictable this year, though. That's one thing I will say. Which is when you're a bubble team, like that's that's kind of life as a as a bubble team, right? You're you're just not very yeah. consistent. And uh, this team, because of its its parts and things that were out of their control this year, is is much more inconsistent than they they otherwise probably would be. And to be fair, and uh, this is going to sound a little scathing, to label them as a bubble team at the moment is a little kind. I'm a, I'm going to give it to them, Dy. I'm going to give it to them. They're a bubble team, you know, because screw the net. All right, what does what does the net know? You know I, 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 net I, I put them the I put them back on it. I put them back on with TCU. If they beat TCU, I put them back on. All right. Cats, you're on the bubble to me. You're on the bubble to me. All right. Net does not know ball. We can get net the hell out of here. All right. Um, It's going to wrap it up for us. I believe we should have Cole back next time that we uh, chat with you. But appreciate, as always, our friends at Holiday Distillery. Get your Ben Holiday bottled and bond bourbon. Uh, Get your 360 vodka. We also appreciate Homefield Apparel. Homefieldapparel.com. Promo code 3mod23 for 15% off your first order. And uh, thanks to Tucker Franklin for uh, filling in with us today. Much appreciate that, as always. That'll do it for us here on 3mod. Take care. Go Cats. And we will talk to you soon.